Okay, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, the third uh, in a series of webinars from the Resilient Waters Program. As a program, we have been in existence over the last five years, and um, the webinar series is actually just looking to share lessons amongst us as participants in the program, but also to hear from others who have participated uh, in partnership with us over the years, other initiatives that have been going on um, in a collective effort to strengthen ecosystem and livelihood impact pathways, uh, collectively looking to build a more resilient and inclusive Southern Africa. So we've had, we've set up a, a series of four webinars. The first one was looking at um, the WASH sector and looking at what we've done at a national level, uh, planning, looking at gaps, and then looking at local level activities, taking the national planning into action at local level. That was done in the beginning of the month. Then last week, we had another uh, webinar looking at human wildlife conflict and lessons around human wildlife conflict from Southern Africa. Again, we are looking at how do we, what are we learning in terms of improving ecosystem and livelihood impact pathways? Um, and today we will be looking at climate smart agriculture and other kinds of small scale agricultural practices and looking at what lessons we've learned, we can learn across from the Southern African region and beyond, uh, again, in a, in a bid to share experience in terms of building impact pathways for a resilient and inclusive Southern Africa. Next week, we will be having our last uh, webinar series, which is looking at um, overlook, overlapping governance issues of multifunctional landscapes. And uh, would encourage you at the end of this webinar to uh, encourage your friends and colleagues to attend that one as well. But for now, to take us through the webinar for today, I have the pleasure of introducing our facilitator, Mr. Steve Collins. Um, over to you, Steve. Um, thank you, Kule, and um, welcome everybody to, to the webinar. Thank you for joining. Um, we really appreciate your time and the time you, you, you've taken if you attended some of the other ones as well as this. Um, as Kule says, my name is Steve Collins. I'm with the Resilient Waters Program. I'm the Livelihoods and Adaptation Advisor on the program, and part of my brief has been trying to assist communities and work with organizations that are working in this field of climate smart or climate resilient um, agriculture. Um, in terms of the, the USAID uh, Resilient Waters Program, as Kule says, our aim was to build a more resilient and water secure Southern Africa. And in that, we had a focus on four particular areas as a way just to organize the, the work and organize ourselves. Um, those four you can see there, improved transboundary water security and resource management, increased access to safe, sustainable drinking water and sanitation services, strengthen ability of communities and key institutions to adapt to change, particularly the impacts of climate change, and lastly, um, conserve biodiversity and ecosystems. We know that these are all interrelated, um, and we've tried our best to make sure that when we do the different works that we, we make those connections. But this particular piece of work and what we're going to be talking about today really falls within the, the issue of how do we make communities in our rural areas that rely on rain fed agriculture more resilient to the impacts that we know are going to happen and are happening uh, due to just more energy in the system uh, trapped by greenhouse gases and um, the impacts of climate change. So maybe we should start with some kind of orientation when we say what is climate smart or climate resilient agriculture? Um, and just uh, to note that these are not my thoughts. These are the, the thoughts that were gathered by one of the artificial intelligence apps that are out there. When I asked the question, what is climate smart agriculture? I was told that it aims to transform agri-food systems towards green and climate resilient practices. It aims to tackle three main objectives, namely sustainably increasing agricultural productivity and incomes, adapting and building resilience to climate change and reducing or removing greenhouse gas emissions. When I asked the same chat, what is climate resilient agriculture? 
which wasn't a term I must say I, I knew before I started this program. It was something that was introduced by one of our grantees, the Maflatini Development Foundation. They said they prefer to use this term, um, climate resilient agriculture. And it, the, the smart tech said it is an approach that includes sustainably using existing natural resources through crop and livestock production systems to achieve long-term higher productivity and farm incomes under a changing climate. This practice reduces hunger and po poverty in the face of climate change for forthcoming generations. And as we know, it's not just a challenge for forthcoming generations, it's a challenge for this generation. Um, certainly in Africa, we are still dealing with nutrition poverty um, and other, uh, other kinds of poverty. So this is something that even amongst ourselves right now, we need to deal with. So within the Resilient Waters Program, we've had a, a couple of ways of working. One has been to give, and, to give grants to local partners. The other is to work with institutions that already work within the region, be they intergovernmental like SADC, Food, Agriculture and Natural Resources, or some of the institutes and NGOs that work across the region. So some of those I just want to highlight uh, are, as I already mentioned, the Makhlatini Development Foundation. We worked with them in Limpopo province in South Africa, working on backyard gardens, uh, water saving uh, um, technologies. And I think interesting coming out of that, as they said, and it was at a time, just to say, <laughs> maybe this whole program in a way happened through a pandemic. And one of the, the areas that were certainly impacted on is a people's ability to work, people's ability to access food. Um, and coming out of the work that they did, they said one of the more interesting and more resilience building activities were the, when they got farmers together, just to first of all start talking about climate resilient agriculture, they then ended up uh, setting up village savings committees, which enabled people to access funds when they needed it. So it's often not the most obvious thing that comes out of these programs that you think is going to be building resilience. It might be something that is designed in the field and that certainly came out of that program was one of our lessons. Pabalelo Trust, you'll be hearing from Deposo later. They did conservation agriculture in Botswana and Eco exists. They talked in a, uh, the previous webinar on the elephant aware farming in Botswana. Um, and then a Namibia Nature Foundation, um, which worked in the Kavanga region of Namibia and really worked with communities there, giving them a, a climate smart agricultural technique. Those four all received grants from Resilient Water Program. Um, the last thing I want to highlight, um, and we will be seeing a, a video shortly, is we worked with the Inst International Water Management Institute. Uh, sorry, I see I got that acronym wrong. Um, because MWE, I always, when I say it, it seems the M rolls off my tongue easier. Um, and they are one of the consultative group of international agricultural research uh, organizations. And we worked with them initially on something called the Two Degree Initiative, which was a challenge put to researchers, people with a lot of knowledge, but often not in touch with what's happening on the ground or the knowledge is not used. And it was about how can we link science to the users? And coming out of that was the Ukama Ustawi Maize Diversification Program, which is now happening. Um, Cindy, perhaps if we could just show the brief video, which tries to capture why we should be linking science and technology to, to users on the ground. Science investing for people and the planet. The Southern African Grand Challenge connects science, industry, policy and finance to take a leap forward into a climate resilient future. As part of the global two degree initiative, this challenge focuses on nine countries and four themes for collaborative action and investing. Southern Africa is a climate hotspot. Weather extremes are affecting workforces, transportation systems and supply chains from field to fork. Science investing can help build resilient societies so what does a climate resilient future look like? By 2030, 10 million small scale farmers and water users can effectively respond to climate shocks and stresses. Public and private partners provide advisory support services to climate proof food, water and energy supply chains. A growing regional economy creates opportunities for secure livelihoods and inclusive wealth creation. Together, we can catalyze science, build partnerships, and leverage finance 
to address present and future challenges in this region. What investment opportunities are available for you? Invest in climate information systems and agricultural technology to secure food production. Stimulate investment in business processes along whole supply chains that are water-wise, energy efficient and reduce waste and losses. Leverage finance for policy and incentives across sectors to achieve the SADC region's development goals. Share risks and rewards in building an inclusive economy for people and the planet. Leave no one behind, leap forward into a resilient future. Thanks, um, th thanks, Andy. Um, so I think as you can see, that was part of our, our, our plan. I'm happy to say we have achieved some of those objectives and some of the work you'll hear about shortly really will talk to trying to find a way that we link knowledge to practice. So our, uh, we have three panelists today before we have um, some discussion later. While the panelists are talking, please, if you have any questions, um, either to that panelists or in general, if it's to the panelists, please, just note that, put them in the chat and we will, uh, we will get to them at, after all three have presented. So there are our, our three panelists uh, and let's move straight away to uh, Sitembili, if I can just introduce her. Um, Tembi is with the Food, Agricultural and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, otherwise known as Fan Pan where she coordinates climate smart agricultural policy research and advocates and advocacy projects. The work focuses on enhancing the research into the policy and practice interface to help raise investment in and policy support for climate smart agriculture. She manages a portfolio of programs that include projects on irrigation water management, post harvest management and climate smart resilient agriculture. She'll be looking at the outcome of the 2023 Regional Climate Smart Agricultural Policy Dialogue. It was held in March at the University of Pretoria. I was, I was happy to be there, and it was really interesting to see what's coming out of work across the region. Over to you, Tembi. Thank you, Steve, and um, thank you to the USA Resilient Waters Program team for inviting Fon Pan to be part of this ongoing dialogue on creating resilient food systems. Um, allow me to just spend a minute or two just sharing a bit about Fun Pan and, and what we do before I get into the outcomes of the recent policy dialogue. So Fun Pan is an autonomous multi-stakeholder policy network with a mandate to coordinate agriculture policy research, analysis, dialogue, and to promote the dissemination of policy relevant research results across Africa. Um, we also serve as a platform for dialogue and engagement of all food systems um, actors right uh, across the, the continent. I think the reason why um, this webinar was of interest to us was also because we are currently implementing our strategic plan that focuses on two thematic thrusts. Um, the first one being the nutrition sensitive agriculture and the second one being the climate smart agriculture thematic thrust. So these themes address the nexus challenges that are presented by climate change and malnutrition in Africa. So as to ensure sustainable and resilient transformative changes in our agriculture and food systems. And um, the dialogue that we recently held, it focused on the theme transitioning to climate resilient farming systems in Sub-Saharan Africa, which we believe is really an important conversation um, point because um, in as much as we have progressed as a continent um, in terms of our um, in terms of our production and other sort of areas within the agriculture space, um, the threat of climate change is ever more present. And so as we think about how to increase productivity and also improve the quality of food, we also have to think about doing that in the context of climate change. So really the dialogue was to, um, to get stakeholders to engage and, and come up with solutions 
on how do we transition to climate resilient farming systems. Uh, we convened the dialogue in collaboration with um, the Transforming Smallholder Irrigation in Southern Africa Consortium Partners, of which FANPAN is the policy lead in that consortium. We also worked with the FANPAN node hosting institution in South Africa, the National Agriculture Marketing in Council. Other partners included the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development of South Africa, the ARC, uh, SADAC GMI, um, the International Water Management Institute, SAWITU, HSRC, SACNSAP, and the AATF. I know it's a whole lot of acronyms, but our report, the dialogue report is available and we'll be able to share with them. Uh, with the Resilient Waters team to share with the participants of this dialogue. Um, uh, the dialogue was attended by um, quite a number of people uh, from across the region and from outside the continent over the two days. It was both virtual and, um, and in person. Uh, the policy dialogue was opened by uh, South Africa's Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, uh, Honorable Angela Togozile Didiza, who highlighted Dalred's efforts in promoting climate smart agriculture and responding to natural disasters um, that are becoming more frequent in our region, such as the, you know, the sort of four army worm locust devastation on grain crops and flooding from, from cyclones. As recent, um, the region has been dealing with Cyclone Freddy. So these are things that are really in our face. She urged the participants to work together with the government to address climate change challenges and to leverage the discussions to pave way for transitioning to climate resilient farming systems. So over the three days, the dialogue featured 12 sessions that were grouped under five um, sub themes focusing on technological and governance innovations, circular food systems, social inclusion, capacity building, partnerships and increased investments. So we had uh, the sessions being co-organized by um, some of the partners that we work with that have a sort of special interest and a special focus in either technology, governance, circular food systems, capacity building, or social inclusion. So the stakeholders attending the policy dialogue committed to working together to find sustainable solutions that will ensure access to safe and sufficient water and nutritious food for all. And they called for actions um, that, I that I'm going to highlight in the following three slides, which include, I mean, it's, um, I think we had about 15 um, sort of key messages that came out of the dialogue, but I'll just highlight the ones that um, sort of are relevant to this discussion, I think, and the ones that I, I personally feel uh, deserve an emphasis. So there was a call for strong commitment from food systems actors, including policymakers and government, the private sector farmers and scientists, uh, to work together to achieve climate inclusive agricultural planning and imp implementation. Um, there was also a call for sustainable agriculture practices that promote water conservation and increase food production. Uh, some of these practices include things such as rainwater harvesting, conservation agriculture, and agroforestry all which fall under the ambit of climate smart agriculture. I think one other sort of important um, message or call that came out of the dialogue was the need for increased private sector participation in working together with government in identifying policy gaps and investment opportunities for improving productivity and for a sustainable transition to highly profitable food systems. There was a general recognition, I think, right across the sort of uh, big conference venue that there is no point to policy decisions if there is no investment that follows them. So uh, there will just be statements of intent, but once we have implementation plan and then we have budgets that accompany those sort of uh, statements of intent, then that's where we'll see a real change on the ground. Another um, sort of interesting area that was really highlighted was the need to invest in new technologies 
um, including ICTs, biotechnology, and innovations in agriculture, which can improve productivity and resilience by saving on water and energy, particularly in drought uh, prone areas. Um, the, the, the theme of circular food systems was also um, quite a heated one where there was a call to promote circular economy solutions and food systems that can help the continent feed its growing population, but at the same time would help to address uh, significant societal and environmental issues. So um, the policy dialogue was supported by the um, Australian Center for International Agriculture Research, which is currently supporting the work that's being done in Tanzania, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, focusing on transforming smallholder irrigation scheme. And so the dialogue was officially closed by Her Excellency Tegan Brink, who is the Australian High Commissioner to South Africa, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Botswana. She highlighted and emphasized Australia's commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals and also its development cooperation agenda with African countries um, that wants to see, uh, that wants to advance stability, growth and prosperity. So um, the dialogue provided an opportunity for stakeholders from, 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 from the region to really reflect together and develop recommendations to help build climate smart and resilient farming system. And it was during the dialogue that we also crafted messages that were later on presented at the UN 23 Water Conference deliberations by Dr. Inga uh, from, from IMWI, who was our ambassador and uh, carried the region's voices to the water conference. As you will see in the next slide, participants really had an opportunity to engage, share their experiences, and make recommendations on what's needed to transform our food systems. Uh, the Agriculture Research Council also facilitated a field visit where they showcased the institution's CSA practices. You'll see the green t-shirts in the next slide where our participants went to the field, they demo, they, they tested um, uh, the drones that the ARC uses to monitor some of their fields. They also looked at some of the sort of lab testing uh, equipment that has been improved and helps to sort of provide farmers with feedback on the quality of their soils and the quality of their water, all which is part of um, climate smart agriculture. Um, so for me, really, the takeaway from this dialogue was that investment priorities for transitioning to climate resilient farming systems in our region should really be guided by a commitment to sustainability, equity, and long-term development. And by investing in climate resilient farming systems, our re this will ensure that our region has sustainable food production, resilient livelihoods, and the healthy environment for not just us, but for our children and their children for years and years to come. So it was really um, a pleasure to host um, delegates from right across Southern Africa and, and have these discussions and come up with uh, recommendations on what is needed to transform to a resilient, climate resilient farming systems. And thank you to the Resilient Waters team for allowing us to be part of this um, uh, webinar, part of this ongoing dialogue that is also bringing some key lessons and recommendations from the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tembi. Um, seeing those pictures of the field visit makes me sad that I, I missed that part. I was there for the first, I uh, couldn't make the third day, unfortunately. Looks like you had fun. Um, and it looks like some interesting technologies. Um, our next um, panelist is Dr. Munya Mutenje from the International Water Management Institute and uh, a program called uh, ACRRA. As uh, Tembi said, there are a lot of acronyms in this, uh, um, in this part of the world, um, which is Accelerating Impacts of the CGIRR Climate Research for Africa. Um, Dr. Munya is a researcher looking at scaling water solutions at IMWI. She has a PhD degree in agricultural economics from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She's managed to complete more than 10 
market value chain studies from maize, legume crops, fodder crops, livestock um, in four Southern African countries being Zimbabwe, Zambia, Mozambique, and Malawi. Um, she'll be talking today about initiatives from the Consultative Group for International Agricultural Research, now known as the, the CGIR, or people in this, in this world talk about the CG. And the CG's aim is really to reduce rural poverty, increase food, food security, improve human health and nutrition, and sustainable management of natural resources. Uh, as USAID Resilient Waters, we had the opportunity to work with, with Imwe in the developing of the Ukama Ustawi concept, um, which has now been implemented. And today she'll be looking at work done by the CG in Zambia. Over to you, Munya. Hello, everyone. We're presenting uh, on behalf of, um, of CGAR senders. As you know, uh, 15 CGAR senders are now in one group called One CG Center. Um, and we have been working as a consortium in various countries, uh, including, um, including Zambia. In Zambia, the main focus will be on the ICRA project, which is accelerating the impact uh, of CGAR Center in Climate Resilient Research for Africa. Zambia is one of the six countries that this project is being implemented. Um, in Zambia, we, we, we use the value chain approach. So we are working in six uh, value chains um, and uh, we have four CG centers represented uh, in, this, uh, in this project. And it's a World Bank funded project. We have uh, these six countries include um, Zambia, Ethiopia, Kenya, Ethiopia and Kenya for East Africa, Zambia is the only country for Southern Africa. Then we have uh, Senegal, Mali, and Ghana for West Africa. But Zambia is being in Southern Africa with one uh, with one um, rainfall season. It's unique. So we are using um, bundling of climate information services and climate smart technologies to build resilient um, resi climate resilient smallholder farming systems within different agroecological uh, zones. As you know, Zambia is one of the diverse, um, has got diverse agroecological regions. That's why it was piloted in Zambia because it tends to represent um, most countries within Southern Africa. So why is it important to look at um, climate resilience? As you have seen, we have had challenges in terms of climate change and variability. Though in Zambia, our most challenge is climate variability, not change, because um, what is actually what is actually impacting uh, smallholder farmers is the erratic onset of, uh, of the rainfall seasons and also the um, increasing frequency of droughts and floods uh, due to several reasons. Um, we haven't had like shifts in uh, large shifts in the amount of rainfall. It's mainly variability. That's why we need we, we are focusing on climate variability to build climate resilience. The other key thing that we as a project that we are focusing on is integrating climate information services and climate smart agricultural innovations. We noted that from all the previous um, bilateral projects or core projects that we have had, without climate information, reliable climate information services, farmers are not able to make informed decisions and pick up um, different uh, climate uh, smart technologies that suits their resource endowments. And also we found out that when climate challenges or climate variability challenges come up, but for example, if a drought is also accompanied with uh, pests and diseases uh, infestation. So normally you need a bundle of climate, climate smart agriculture innovations to deal with the challenges that come up with this uh, climate shocks. Um, the other key thing that we have also found out is that without sustainable financial inclusions, when we mean sustainable is that where we have uh, investments that cut across generations times and um, also across uh, across nations or agroecological zones, we will not be very successful in tackling climate change or climate variability shocks. Social inclusion is also a key component because we tend to have different um, different uh, population uh, dynamics. Uh, so we tend to have women dominated. We also need our youth to be involved in agriculture. As you see, we are having aging population. So if we don't include our youth, 
at the early stage and within key value uh, chain nodes will not be it uh, will not be successful in tackling or building climate resilient um, climate resilient farming systems. So we need both uh, all the different segments of the population within this fraternity as we build a climate resilient farming system. How we are doing it um, in the ICRA project? In the ICRA project, we are using five modalities. Uh, the first one is accelerator grants with SMEs where they bundle up um, climate innovation technologies. And we have what we call out stakeholder dialogues to look at the policy and institutional e issues that are important in building climate, res uh, climate resilience. On the issue of social inclusion, we have got innovation and internship grants such that we have a group of farmers that are well equipped, that are commercially, mind commercially minded, that come up into the agricultural sector. Agricultural sector has long been um, tended as something that is not very lucrative. So we are looking at engaging the youths to see that there is potential, there is some business potential within the agricultural sector using the innovation and internship grant. We also use the agricultural data hub. With the agricultural data hub, we use, we bring up different um, uh, stakeholders to generate reliable and effective um, information that is required by farmers that relates to weather, that relates to the climate smart um, technologies that can that they can easily get the information, the reliable information from different sources easily and cheaply. Then we have different communication channels, like we use the radios, we use um, uh, TV, if you have heard of the Monda Makeover TV shows, share some of the successes, challenges with farmers. We also use uh, SMEs, to share some of um, some of the required information by farmers so that we access everyone everyone is included and we leave no one behind so with the I'll look at the different um, innovations that we are having um, we have uh, the innovation accelerator innovation grant with the accelerator innovation grant we work with MS uh, with um, small to medium enterprises who are bundling different technologies and who work uh, as partnerships so we have got five uh, bundles, climate smart innovation bundles. The first one is to deal with sustainable financing of off-grid uh, solar irrigation. In this bundle, we have um, three partners. One, one that deals with financing the solar equipment, the, uh, which is Lupia. Then the second one, which deals with uh, supplying them off-grid solar, solar irrigation equipment, Vitalite. Then we have got um, Lima Links that provides information on markets and weather to the farmers using different channels. Then we'd say the second one is integrated agriculture and agricultural system, mainly in Luapola province. Uh, this one brings in, in fisheries, agriculture, fish production into the agricultural system. As you know that protein is a key component um, particular when it comes to food security. So if you integrate fish, and it also helps in terms of um, smoothening cash flows, uh, instead of just relying on crop seasonal crop production, rain fed, you also have another stream of income from aquaculture. We have another one, bundle three, that is addressing drought through climate smart um, varieties and water management uh, strategies. This includes five partners, of which one of the key partner is the government, the, the Zambia Research uh, Agricultural Research Institute that helps bring in uh, technologies, particularly the seed, uh, the water management strategies into the pipeline so that we don't run out of our strategies as these vagaries intensify. On the fourth one is diversified, integrated, um, mixed um, uh, live small stock, goats and sheep, then chickens with legumes, uh, mainly in the Eastern province, um, being run by um, Two partners, that is Comaco and the Chiteke Keso Federation, which is a corporate, a, a federation of 55 cooperatives. Then the last one, which is the additional, uh, is mainly dealing with gender and social inclusion, um, where we look at women uh, that have survived gender-based violence and teenager mothers and integrate them into the legume, cereal legume value chains as well as horticulture so that they are able to build their livelihoods in a sustainable manner. 
So with the um, financing of off-grid um, uh, solar irrigation, as I've already alluded, we have got Lupia, which is offering uh, financial startups to far smallholder farmers, particularly uh, female micro entrepreneurs. We have Vitalite providing the solar irrigation equipment. So farmers, um, they have they get financial credits, which goes direct to Vitalite for specific irrigation technologies they require to venture into different enterprises, uh, which include uh, mainly green millets for winter, horticultural commodities, where they are um, linked to other or to uh, output markets. We have uh, Lima Links providing them, uh, providing the market linkages for the product and for the inputs and also information about the weather. The bundle two, in bundle two, we have got um, six partners along the agriculture value chain. Uh, within the six partners, we have uh, Hopeways Casa Calabre as the main seed suppliers. They supply fingerlings to different farmers around their area, and they also offer extension services to the farmers and cooperatives around their area. We then have uh, Adesca Enterprise that offers uh, supplies seed, uh, that supplies feed for the different um, aquaculture enterprises and livestock enterprises. Uh, we have Unimos that is, um, that is um, an outgrower that also supports farmers around their area on how to do fish farming. Um, in this um, Unimos integrates fish, tilapia fish farming with um, piggery and poultry. Um, Triple Blessing uh, is another partner, which is an off taker it buys the fish. So we have, we are looking at the whole value chain. Then we have got Kasama Arts, which disseminates information on good farming practices on, and also information on weather, weather information through drama and arts. Uh, so that's uh, that's the bundle two. So with bundle two, they, uh, they integrate uh, fish uh, production into agriculture. So we have some integrating fish with other uh, livestock production, some they're integrating fish with banana production, some integrating fish with um, um, horticultural production, depending on the uh, where there are opportunities uh, within that within their within their communities. Uh, in the bundle three, we are addressing drought um, through climate seed varieties and water management. So we have um, plant catalyst and organic biostimulant that is used for water conservation and also for nutrients um, for the for for them for the crops. It's used both for uh, dry land and also for rain-fed irrigation. So it's used in um, crop production and horticultural production. Then we've got. Um, uh, Zambia Agricultural Research Institute also running uh, different um, uh, different uh, different pilot studies to see what um, how much fertilizer the cost looking at the cost benefit which amounts of fertilizer with uh, go go together with different uh, amounts of organic biostimulant and the different uh, drought tolerant varieties and what um, combinations of cereal legumes can be sustained uh, with uh, the different um, fertilizer and organic biostimulant. Uh, then we've got uh, IDE, an NGO with large small farmers and lead uh, large uh, with a big network of small scale farmers that are both doing solar irrigation and also that are doing rain fed irrigation, testing all this. And within the IDE, we also have good farm business. Um, we also use the farm business model where we are saying farmers, instead of relying only on crop production, they can also be aggregators of inputs that they sell to the local communities and also demonstrate their um, full, like also demonstrate um, of piloting demonstrate the effectiveness of the different climate smart bundles. Uh, within these farmers will choose either to be um, aggregators of inputs or outputs, um, and then uh, they get commissions from big companies or agglomerates uh, that are offering those uh, different uh, seed packages. Um, that's bundle three, and it's mainly located in central province, though they are expanding to Copper Belt and Eastern Province.
The, the fourth bundle, it's mainly in Eastern province, um, though they're also planning to expand to central province. These, they look at um, legume, poultry, and small stock value chains. Um, in all our bundles, as you have seen, we have got, we look at the whole value chain. So we have got people who, um, we have got the ultimate buyer of the sole commodities. So Comarco, it's a processing company that buys legumes and maize from uh, farmers who are practicing conservation agriculture together with agroforestry, where they mainly use glaracidia. Uh, and within this, they also have secured a market for those um, that a, a, a secure market for organically produced groundnuts uh, within the region. Uh, then we have the Chitetezo Federation of 55 um, Pharma cooperatives, mainly led by both uh, women and men. And um, in the Chitetels of Federation, we are trying to bring in the warehouse system so that people or farmers don't just sell their commodities soon after harvest. They also have to sell their commodities when prices are um, very high and they're able to hedge against shocks through in different investments as they make uh, profits. So within this one, um, we have a Comaco processing products from, uh, from these co cooperatives and buying uh, commodities from the cooperatives. We also have good cooperatives that are also doing, um, producing legume seed um, or using a, um, a, a model whereby they pass on or they produce so that they sell to the other farmers so that they also have readily available um, legume seed. As you all know, uh, legume seed production tends to be very a, a constraint, particularly with private companies. The last um, bundle that we have of climate smart agriculture is the um, one where we do sustainable economic participation and inclusion and livelihood, where we are focusing young teenager mothers that, uh, so, so that we, we they, 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 they participate within key value chain um, uh, legume um, value chains. In this group, uh, we mainly target um, people living with HIV and survivors of gender-based uh, gender violence and young women. Uh, we work with uh, different um, social networks. Uh, in this bundle, uh, women, farmers, they work together uh, as cooperatives or as individuals uh, to produce different um, legume products. They also access information on markets and information on weather information through SMEs and also through radios that are directly linked to them. Uh, the other modality that I've been talking about that ICRA is using is innovation and internship, mainly targeting our youth within uh, from cities. See, we use five in this um, innovation internship grant. We use five mechanisms. Um, this include um, climate information hackathon, whereby we have competitive um, grants or startups for um, the youths from different universities in Zambia, where they look at a particular problem, let's say waste management that can be turned into sustainable agricultural practices. For example, we've got a group of youth that have been looking at how to turn vegetable waste from the market into organic fertilizer using different types of worms. Then um, in this, uh, when they go through, they go through mentorship and um, uh, for about uh, three to six months, then from there, they then look at how they can commercialize their product through these memberships. Um, so the best of four from the previous one, we've had 78 participants, but we selected 10 best that went through different stages of uh, mentorship. And the second one, which is the business incubation hub, we look at those graduate students that have got um, an innovative um, idea that they want to try to solve a key climate smart challenge um, within specific value chains. And these, um, they, they, are also, they also go through an innovation hub um, where they are also mentored to bring their product into a commercial product. The other one is uh, looks at internship with private sector entities where we identify and link students that are, have graduated or that are still graduating to solve a specific uh, problem for a specific private company. Um, the other one is uh, we are also working with universities to look at um, the curriculums 
um, from college, short courses and um, uh, postgraduate courses so that we include climate and information services within this um, curriculum so that we have got a better focused future. The final one is climate smart agricultural climate information de demand driven research not just like do we look at how can we have research that addresses key problems the real problems and how can they be funded either through private sector or uh, partnerships between private sector and non-governmental organizations the agricultural um data hub this works with different partners from the private sector from the gov public sector to generate early warning systems or weather analysis uh, weather weather data particularly from zmd and also that is then used to um, inform farmers in better agronomic in uh, agronomic practices or climate smart technology they can take for a particular season or for a law that can help them build, build resilient climate smart technologies. So within the agricultural data hub, we've got different information coming in and then, uh, then the data processing. And then um, we have, uh, once the data has been processed, then it's then disseminated to farmers using various channels. So it's also a value ch chain looking at how you generate reliable, effective, climate smart agricultural data and weather information services that will inform farmers on effective uh, decision making that helps build climate resilient farming systems. Uh, to conclude, um, is that uh, for us to have more resilient farming systems within Southern Africa, in Zambia, particular, um, we need um, we need coordinated action between multiple actors. It's not only the agricultural sector. We also need the nutritional uh, and healthy. We also need the education sector. We also need uh, other sectors like the finance to look at how we can come up with premiums uh, in terms of in agricultural credits for the farmers so that they're able to invest in climate smart technologies. We also need uh, a combination of uh, climate information service technologies and clim climate, info climate smart technologies. So within this, you need um, technologies from the ICT to disseminate the information. We need microfinance, we need weather index insurance so that farmers are hedged from the shocks that they are not able to, so that they're able to recover after a severe drought or, or floods that can wipe out all their uh, investments. This uh, this is a, col a collaboration as I've been uh, alluding to of IITA ICRIS at World Fish IRI. So, um, uh, Imi is part of it and is leading this component in Zambia. Thank you so much for uh, listening and attending to our um, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Munya. I mean, it, it really does strike me, as you're saying, that the solution requires so many different partners to be involved. And I think a lot of the, the time and effort required to organize those those partners often is not a, is not accounted for when we, de when we design projects. And I think we need to to make sure it happens. And as, as you go, you talked about the dialogue that has started with multi-stakeholder dialogues, um, you, you end up um, implementing some great projects. So thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to, to all of you uh, listening and watching, please um, put any questions in the chat. Uh, we, we did see there is one there. Um, we will be coming to those um, uh, after Deposo, our next uh, panelist has, has spoken. So if I could just uh, briefly introduce uh, Diposo uh, from Pabalelo Trust. Uh, Diposo Matio is the Director and Program Coordinator at Pabalelo Trust. He's the Lead Climate Smart Farming Curriculum Developer and Trainer. He's the Lead Resource Mobilizer and the Overall Team Manager. Um, and he reports to a board of uh, uh, trustees that, uh, that manage Pabalelo Trust. His three major interests in his career have been biodiversity conservation, agriculture, and human or community development. And um, we have got to know him, know him over the last while, certainly virtually, because we haven't visited uh, enough. Uh, but he has, as he has been the key implementer of our grant in the panhandle area of the Okavango Delta in Botswana. He's going to be looking at some lessons learned during their work when they've been implementing it what they call conservation agriculture. And that is agriculture that does not impact negatively on the environment, but still creates or hopefully surpasses the yields of traditional slash and burn farming. Um, uh, Diposo, you're, you're welcome, um, over to you.
Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Thank you to the Resilient Waters uh, program for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, just want to say thank you to Tenbi and Dr. Mutenje for the wonderful uh, presentations that they put uh, before us. Um, well, my name is Diposo Maitio. I'm the program coordinator of Pabalelo Trust, uh, located in Samuchima. Samuchima is uh, in the Okavango, along the Okavango Western Panhandle in Botswana. And uh, <clears throat> Pabalo Trust is a small NGO that uh, was formed around the years of 2000, between 2007 and 2009. And with the main uh, focus to support smallholder farmers, uh, dryland farmers who were seen to be struggling with uh, climate change issues in terms of uh, their yields going down every season. Um, also, knowing that the, the Okavango River and Okavango Delta the, 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 is a world heritage um, and also a Ramsar site. And obviously that comes with uh, many uh, uh, restrictions from government and from the international community in terms of how to utilize uh, the, the natural environment in this area. So Babalo Trust came in to try and uh, cushion the shock that the farmers were, experiment, were experiencing and also to make sure that uh, livelihoods uh, the the yields from the field. The, there's a way of making sure that uh, the farmers get something from the fields. So, as a, a grantee of the USAID Resilient Waters Program, uh, part of what we do is conservation agriculture, like Steve has said. And conservation agriculture has three principles, which are um, minimum tillage or less uh, disturbance of the soil when, when, when farming. And the second principle being uh, soil cover or mulching. And then the third principle is crop rotation. And we try to instill that uh, knowledge, those principles into our farming systems around the communities to try and bring that uh, into action and see if we can get the results that uh, the international community say they get from con uh, conservation agriculture. But uh, those uh, come with or have uh, the experiments, the work that we have done over the years has given us a few lessons to learn. So the first lesson that I want to share with you is that uh, we need to do more to convince farmers. Um, as much as we see that these principles are not necessarily uh, foreign ideas, but uh, the farmers themselves, as you introduce the principles to them during training, uh, somehow it appears or it comes across as a foreign idea. For example, uh, farmers have always uh, done what we call in the local language here, uh, thikanga, which is a small backyard uh, field where they don't plow, they don't use the mold boards. They just use their old, their small um, hand holes to to dig small holes, planting holes, and by that they they would have done their their, their agriculture, their, their their farming. That's minimum tillage, but when you bring that idea as something learned from elsewhere, it's hard for people to accept it as something that has been happening already. Because if you now 
talk of measurements, you're talking of uh, standards, that alienates the idea as if it's something that is coming from uh, very far away and that needs time to be adopted. So this idea is for farmers to really adopt this. The NGOs and other partners, other players that uh, bring in such in initiatives need to need time to really um, demonstrate what they what they, what they want uh, the their communities to adopt. That's what I've learned. We need to demonstrate. We need to have our own demonstrations, successful demonstrations, uh, to really convince and show the results of what we are talking about. The next uh, point I want to share with you is that. Uh, we also need to make uh, climate smart agriculture or specifically conservation agriculture for our uh, situation. We need to make it attractive. Why are we saying this? Uh, it's easier to do uh, our usual conventional farming because you just bring your donkeys with the multiple plow and if a hectare is done within a week, then you you just do the weeding, but with uh, climate or conservation agriculture, you are expected to dig basins by hand or with using a hand hole for an extended period of time. It's labor intensive. Uh, it's it's taking most of your energy, most of your your. Uh, your resources. So you need to invest a bit of resources uh, into what you are doing. So if the promoters of these ideas, as much as we realize how important they are, if we could uh, be in a position to place our farmers in an advantageous position, that when we are uh, encouraging them to adopt this, we also are able to provide them with um, <clears throat> Uh, maybe seeds. We also are able to provide them with the implements that are necessary to speed up maybe planters that are able to make their work easier. Uh, that would be very much uh, better and would encourage farmers to adopt. So the, the, the first two challenges or the first two lessons that we learned, these are mainly to do with adoption. It's, it's the reason why uh, most of the farmers are unable to adopt this uh, this wonderful ideas. Um, the third point that I want to share with you also is that um, we are promoting ideas that need to be guarded against any damage from, uh, if you're talking of this area, you are talking of an area of elephants, you are talking of integrated farmers who keep their cattle closer to the fields. So security of the fields is very important, very key. And we've learned as Pavalo Trust that you need to secure the fields. And the struggle to keep the fields secure uh, combined with uh, the labor intensive uh, climate smart or uh, conservation agriculture, uh, those can be very exhausting for the farmer and they would rather go for the easier conventional farming than go the route of the uh, conservation agriculture because now they want to finish quickly with the plowing and go into fencing and uh, protecting their their, their, their crops against the elements. But if we could maybe, uh, the promoters could fundraise, governments could help farmers to fence, especially with solar, protect their fields, uh, make sure that what uh, whatever time they have within the plowing season is dedicated to the actual production of crops that that could give farmers uh, the, enough time to uh, implement conservation agriculture. 
the final lesson that we want to share with you as an organization is that uh, we realize that as much as we are promoting climate smart agriculture and climate smart agriculture or climate uh, conservation agriculture in 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 Babalolo Trust, we also realize that uh, places are different. Climate uh, conservation agriculture might be doing very well in the Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, maybe part of South Africa and Eastern part of Botswana, where soils are better, way better than in Northern Botswana or Western Botswana, where is the Kalahari, Kalahari Desert, sandy soils. And that's, that's a, that places the farmers this side on a completely different uh, level of challenges. Uh, we, we need to do localized research. We need to uh, localize our trials. We need to not just copy and paste ideas as they come. We need to really uh, experiment. That's why we need, as uh, the promoters, we need to have uh, very, powerful demonstrations that are dedicated to experimenting different scenarios based on our challenges uh, that maybe could give us better results, that could give us better options that might slightly de deviate from the normal uh, culture to what is uh, able to work within our means and our challenges and the elements. Uh, we also realized that we cannot make conclusions within short uh, time of piloting. We need to go on and on. We need to be perseverant, which is what the Babalo Trust is, has been for the years. And it's our perseverance that uh, has given us this opportunity to have gotten funding from USAID Resilient Waters Program for the past two years, which just ended end of March. And we really thank the Resilient Waters Program team for believing in us, for going the tough road with us. And thank you very much for, to everyone for attending the webinar from us at Babalelo. We thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deposo. Um, I think you raised some very important lessons there that are hopefully for, for future planning and uh, funding, um, they, they're taken into account. And I'm, I'm struck by the one, a lot of the aspects you mentioned actually was around the issue of energy. And it, um, we know that I think part of the, the whole world, when we talk about climate smart, you also need to do deal with mitigation. So part of that mitigation is getting away from um, for example, fertilizers which come out of coal and oil. So we need to find ways, and, I, and when you talked about organic fertilizers, so I think it's once again, we need to also be thinking it's about mitigation as well as adaptation. Um, and your point about, yes, the sandy soils, the climate smart agriculture is not gonna work everywhere. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there have been some, um, we're now on to the part of the of our program which deals with the discussion and there were some uh, questions raised in the in the chat which i think i'd like to get to first um i think it's erica uh with my she put some she put a couple of questions one was first of all to tembi um and it was around the role of of, of pollinators um and uh i don't know um if, if, if the question's not clear, perhaps uh, Tembi could ask for some clarification from, from Erica, if you don't mind coming on and just clarifying what the, the, what the question exactly is. Okay, um, maybe I can just attempt to respond it, sure. to it so sure. I understand it. I think maybe um, one thing I can say is that although nothing specific was said about pollinators at the regional policy dialogue, I think the science is very clear that um, climate change and biodiversity loss are interlinked and that coupling climate mitigation targets 
with ecosystem-based approaches is, is essential. I think that's why we're hearing now more and more of nature-based sort of approaches to addressing climate change. And it, it's also for me, it's impossible to address sort of loss of biodiversity without addressing climate change. But equally impossible is to tackle the full impacts of climate change without working to protect and enhance biodiversity. So for me, um, the issues of biodiversity loss and the issues of climate change are very interlinked. And when we talk about climate smart agriculture, I think some proponents of climate uh, smart agriculture, um, they have many of the core principles uh, touching on improving biodiversity. For instance, you're looking at sort of continuous vegetative cover of crop fields, you're looking at reduced tillage and diversified crop rotations, which are all practices really that lead to more sort of improved soil quality and more blossoms to support pollinators and other beneficial sort of insects. So I think whilst nothing specific was said at the, at the policy dialogue, the science for me in this area is very clear that biodiversity loss and climate change are interlinked. And when addressing climate change sort of um, challenges, either through mitigation or adaptation, you we definitely have to also look at how we improve the biodiversity. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Demi. And I think it, it speaks to, I think, what people now call the, the nexus approach of warfare. It used to be used to talk about water, energy, food, and now we say water, energy, food, ecosystems. So, um, and we need to really be thinking about, we know nature is in trouble. I mean, part of uh, the legacy of the kind of agriculture that's been practiced up to now has been devastating to the environment. And now we are, we are, we are feeling it. So I think um, we need to think about co-benefits when we introduce these kind of projects. And as, um, as we know, a lot of Southern Africa, as De Porso says, is we're dealing with like large natural systems um, which uh, have conservation status and how are we impacting on those um, those with different kinds of agriculture need to be considered. Um, and all right, so thank you, thank you very much, Tembi. Perhaps going to the to, to, to the next question, um, also from Erica, who we should note is a PhD candidate. That's I think why she's got a thinking hat on, and maybe she's using this webinar as part of her, her research. Um, she asks, and I think this was in some ways tried to. Uh, be answered by Munia. Um, Munia, do you understand the, the question from, from Erica? Because uh, I see you did put some answers. Perhaps you could just come on and um, address them. Okay, I, I can go ahead and uh, try to expand and uh, explain. I think even the next question on outcomes may be referring, referring to our project. Um, for Erica's question, how we are doing it uh, and how we are selecting um, target area or area of intervention is mainly based on um, it's mainly based on the uh, climate vulnerability and also based on the key value chains that are driving the uh, economic hub within that that agroecological region. As you have, as you have already observed. We are operating in mainly in two agroecological regions of Zambia, so that is region two and region three. Um, we are not in the region region one, which is the driest part, as people are shifting to region two and region one. Um, we in region region to region two and region three. Region three because they are in the higher rain, rainfall area, and leaching is the um, leaching is the biggest. Um, problem they have and also they have frequent floods which also uh, and um, fish uh, fish poultry piggery value chains are key because of their proximity to them to, 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 to DRC and they are on the periphery uh, on the um, they also they are also linked to Tanzania. Uh, they tend they they tend to be higher demand for fish and higher demand for for higher demand for meat from DRC. So we tend to, uh, to look at those according to the priority needs of those particular communities. And those are the key value chains that are driving um, the driving force of the, um, of, the, uh, of the economy, household economy. And they normally integrate with other 
um, enterprises like horticulture, banana production, uh, as well as cassava production. So we tend to look at the climate smart technologies they need, particularly as they face um, flooding and also some intermittent droughts. So uh, the choice is based on the uh, climate vulnerability as well as the main agricultural value chains that are driving the, that economy. I hope I've answered there. Great, thanks. I hope so. If, uh, Erica, if not, please uh, feel free to either come on, raise your hand, or go into the chat. Um, but maybe the question, Munya, before I, um, you go. Can you is come into the chat now, later? Yes. No, no, you, no you, can, you can come in now if you want clarity on that, please. Okay, um, the, the, what, I was, what I was actually on about is the fact that, um, well, about 14 years ago, I developed a model towards sustainable socioeconomic development in my landscape architecture masters. And um, there, I, know, I realized that all the ecological planning and the planning, um, planning that was being done towards establishing what was the ground-based plan that one would actually do your um, evaluations from or, or decide where your implementation would go from, did not consider the, um, the conflict over the scarce resources, did not consider that you have the wildlife um, uh, 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 and the sort of cattle production thingy, um, I'm just using that as an example, piggery could be water, whatever else, the natural and the, and, the, um, and, the, and the stock that were being farmed, did not consider the implication of the actual indigenous persons, their resource base, and what was being done as an economic factor for, for the country, for example, did not consider the fact that the bioregion perhaps extended over the border, which is obviously the transboundary things like that. But um, so what I'm saying is there is conflict over scarce resources, there is conflict over use or usage or needs. And I feel quite strongly that there needs to be a baseline plan before going and spotting where your possible um, uh, uh, circular economy needs are, what has been done to actually see throughout the country, throughout the region, throughout the, uh, the, um, the, the extended ecosystem, for example, the larger ecosystem, one needs a base plan. And I feel it's so important to have that, otherwise we're basically jumping around in bits and pieces and the one may actually negatively affect the other in the end. That was the okay. question. Great, okay, great. Let me ask, let me respond. Um, this being a World Bank, um, a World Bank funded project, uh, as you know, the environmental social surface uh, are key. So we have, before we uh, implement any technology, any come up with the uh, priority, we have to do this environmental, social, and ecological safety. And you really know that you have to go into detail and you, you have to submit your environmental management plan. So um, those conflicts, particularly when it comes to, uh, for example, I can give uh, the conflict between water um, use, between humans, wildlife, uh, also, because we are, tend to have fish farmers, we tend to have uh, horticultural farmers, we have, we have those who are using water, the common resource, common poor resource. So they have to be uh, uh, clearly defined uh, social conflicts management and also ways of whether we, before you start the project or the, um, whatever priorities you're coming with, every you have checked in. So we have a checklist that we uh, worked with before prior to the implementation of the project. So in terms of conflict or transboundary issues, uh, particularly for water pollution, they had to really make sure that mitigation measures or adapt risk adaptation measures were put in place. For example, for our key agriculture, you know that there are hormones that are used to change when you are an outgrower. So you had to make sure that your ponds are uh, situated in uh, located in places where there will not be any spillover into the main rivers as it will impact um, fish production or other um, either prices that other community members are doing. I hope I've answered you. Thank you. Thank you, Munya. I think it's um, what Thank you. Um, um, what it speaks to also is this whole issue of um, you know, trans the transboundary issue, as you as you mentioned, that uh, um, Pollution that is happening, for example, related to agriculture and industry here in Gauteng in South Africa, ends up impacting people in Botswana, in, in Zimbabwe, and eventually in, in Mozambique as well. And those people are relying on that water for both domestic use, agricultural use, et cetera. So I think 
the kind of landscape approach is where we, we do need to go. We need to understand things perhaps around catchments, how do, do systems then, I think within certain areas in SADC, there are cross-boundary animal um, dispersal areas. So the movement of those animals, how does one um, allow that to happen? Because I think as Deposo said, it's also a case of climate smart agriculture is not the solution to everything. Um, part of partly what we need to do is we need to encourage tourism which uh, leaves an impact, a, a good impact back uh, yeah, in, in Southern Africa. So you're gonna need space for that biodiversity. And as we as we heard, as Tembi mentioned, we need to find ways in which we also find ways to uh, Im improve the, the state of biodiversity and its protection. Um, and maybe that, um, that speaks to the point that made, I think by Christopher Bricious and Erica, you also raised the issue about the long-term monitoring of, of, of the impacts. Um, I, I would put that to any of the panelists, but maybe a deposit from your side, perhaps you want to, uh, to talk about um, how we from, certainly from our, our side as, as a program, try to get you to monitor the, the impact um, and uh, what's going forward. And then um, I don't know, I think uh, Graham Paul from USAID is on, the, um, is, is on the call. Maybe he wants to address the issue of the long-term uh, evaluation because as we know, five years is a short term for a program to make an impact. Um, and maybe some of these long-term negative impacts that have been mentioned might be there down the line. But Deposo, maybe we can go to you first. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm not sure if I got your um, question right, but maybe you want, you want to repeat? about the monitoring of, um, you know, the, the kind of impact that we are dealing with. How do we... How do we see if uh, what we're doing is good or bad? How do we uh, put in place, I suppose, markers, how many people are impacted, et cetera? Maybe you can just talk about yourselves as a program. How do you okay. measure success in the long term? Are you And how do you use Thank that you. data to improve? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad to, to share that uh, we were very impressed with how our project began with resilient waters because they put in place a team that helped us uh, realize some of the the ways we could address issues of monitoring evaluation and also our learning from what we are doing so the indicators that came with the program also helped us to set ourselves uh, indicators, targets. What are we targeting? What are we looking at? What would we call success out of this project? So that's what we are, we're using to realize our, to, to monitor, that's what we are monitoring uh, for. Uh, after we carry out the activities, we, we look, we wait and see if what we have we had set to be the achievements or to, to mark the achievements have been met. And uh, I must say through this program, we, we did a lot of wonderful stuff, problem trees, uh, theory of change. Those are very important tools that are helping us to realize how we can look at the future and plan for the future while implementing now. So that's what we, 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 we are doing, Steve. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Deposo. Uh, Munya, I see you um, briefly uh, unmuted. Do you want to talk? Uh, you, obviously, a lot of your work is um, an improvement is around, as you talked about data, gathering data. Uh, how are you using that from your perspective? Because I know the one CG is also trying to make sure that they are able to measure impact um, in, the, in, in the long term and you're working with all kinds of stakeholders. So how are you gathering that information and how are you using it to improve practices? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, all, our, all our participants. Uh, for us, um, we use what you call the Sustainable Intensification Framework. It provides us with certain indicators that we measure. Um, some of the indicators are processes. So we have different outcomes um, 
that we need to that that we have uh, in the long term. That's why the, the 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 project is still continuing. So for us in Zambia, we also need we one of our key our key indicator is the number of uh, effective and um, effective partnerships that we have built, and also the number of um, commercialized products that the youth come up with and that uh, that enables a value chain to make to work more effectively and in an inclusive manner. So we also have got um, also have got uh, PhD students that are looking at various components and to look at the various components, you know, impact it, we, we, it, it's a long term process. So we are looking at the different processes and having different indicators from the sustainable intensification framework. So our indicators are subdivided into those that relates to production, that relates to economic um, growth, that relates to social, we have social indicators in terms of gender empowerment. We also have got uh, gender empowerment, women inclusivity, which in, looks at um, people who are living with personal disabilities, people that have been socially disadvantaged, like ethnicity, how are they benefiting? Um, so we also have got the nutritional component, which looks at within all this, after generating all these technologies, how is it impacting on the nutrition of the children, the nutrition of adolescent, adolescent mothers and women, and then the household at large. And then we've got those for the sustainable development goals. So how are we contributing mainly to three um, uh, sustainable development goals, zero hunger, reduction in poverty and equality. Uh, so those are like the outcomes that we are trying to contribute to uh, because there are also people who are also working within us. So within the partners that are, we are working with within those agroecological region, how are we also collaborating, not duplicating our efforts using the sustainable intensification framework and indicators? I hope I've answered. No, that's great. Thank you. That was a, a very interesting framework uh, that you, you described there. Um, uh, the, the the question of the long term um, impact, and there was a um, maybe a, Graham, as I said, if you're there and you're willing to to answer this question, is uh, from Erica. Is uh, does the program have in mind maintenance and evaluation uh, loops for con continuing the program to get the full picture over at least a 15 year period, um, for example? Um, maybe I, I can't. Uh... Steve, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Please. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I'll start by saying it's a fantastic question, and I don't have a great answer. Um, and I think that that probably speaks to the the rules and the bureaucracy as opposed to the logic and what we know as good development, right? Um, evaluations and that process are key for USAID, um, and that's often uh, in the legislation. So, you know, certain programs that are a certain length of time have to have some sort of evaluation done on them. But but the question's much broader than that, and I understand that. I think that we've been having a lot of conversations with um, with contractors, Steve, such as yourself and Orlando, um, and internally as well about why, I guess, questioning why we program in three year or five year increments? And then what is the best way to continue that kind of continuum of development, right? Because it's not, it doesn't have a start and an end. Um, and I think there is no real easy answer. There's no good answer that I have right now, but it is something that we're fully aware of. Um, and I'm glad it's come up because I think it's something that a lot of donors need to think more carefully about is this, this kind of, um, how do you continue along this this continuum or this path of development instead of these kind of stop, start, stop, starts because you lose momentum, you lose progress, I think. But a, a, a great, a great question. So thank you for that. Thanks. And I think um, it also speaks to, I think something we've been trying with in our program is to um, think really actively about where do we leave these lessons? Where do we leave this data? Partly there's a, there's a couple of things I think we're going to, we're going to try. Certainly we're going to pass on a lot of the information into our existing partners, uh, organizations like CASA, the TFCA, where there now is, we, we get into an end of a livelihoods diversification strategy with them. Um, the kind of data we've collected 
hopefully they will use in, in future or other partners that they um, bring into a system will use. Um, this webinar, for example, and our other webinars, we're going to be putting on the um, Res Hub Africa for Southern Africa, the Resilience Hub for Southern Africa. Um, and you, you, you should go have a look at it because there are a lot of other resources there as well, as well as climate links. So I think that's been also one of the challenges when a program ends, the, um, the, the technical team that's implementing disperses, a lot of that institutional knowledge gets lost, never mind the, the real data. So how do we keep building on this data um, so that in the long term it can be used for decision making? I think is a question a lot of um, different programs need to, need to answer. So I see we, we've unfortunately we're running out of time. Um, and what I would like to do is first of all, thank you for participating. Um, as I mentioned, these webinars will be available for future, future watching and um, hopefully they will be, be used in future. Thank you to the, my panel. We put a lot of effort into putting together those presentations. Um, I certainly have, have learned a lot in the process and I uh, hope you have as well. So if I could hand over or back to Kule Chitepo uh, from our, our program to, to say goodbye and thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. That was really great. And um, colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure on behalf of uh, Olanda Butter, Ms. Olanda Butter, who's the chief of party of the Resilient Waters Program, to, to thank you all for your attendance at this webinar. In particular, I would like to thank our colleagues from uh, Final Plans, Tembile, and from Imwi, Dr. Munya, as well as from Pabalelo Trust, Mr. Deposo. Thank you very much for your fantastic presentations. And thank you to Steve and others who have been involved in putting together this webinar. As I said in the beginning, we, we have one last webinar to go, which will be next week on, the, on Tuesday, the 25th. If you haven't signed up already, please do. We'll be looking at the challenges of different kind of government regi governance regimes that, um, that overlay different kinds of land landscapes. Um, and I think it will be really exciting to look at uh, the areas that we've worked in the Limpopo River Basin, in the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, and other areas where our partners, such as IMWE, have worked just to look at how do you navigate the complexities of every inch of land having often two, three, four, five in some instances, different uh, layers of governance mandates, if you like. Um, and that's a, it, there's a lot that we've learned in that respect as a program. And we're looking forward to sharing that with you. As we, we also share, as I said earlier, our journey in looking at improved pathways for a resilient and inclusive Southern Africa. Thank you very much, colleagues. Have a lovely day further. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.